Today on the show, I'm happy to have Andrew Ernstein. He's the owner of Solar for Planet A. They offer solar installation consulting services across the U.S., and you were just telling me about an interesting install you had to do with implementing solar into a low-income housing project. So how did that go? How did you make it work? Yeah, and this is from early in my career. It was the, it was 20, 2010. It was one of the first commercial installations that I did. So I was working with, well, actually it was 20, 2009 when we started the conversation, but it was new construction. It was a 50-unit apartment building. So it was 2010 by the time we installed it. and. The, the situation was it was low-income housing and they wanted everything to be very egalitarian. So even though they had one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units, they wanted the same amount of solar energy going to each unit. And so that meant 50 different systems and there's only so much room on the roof and only so much money in the budget. So one of the very first generations of microinverters that became available around that time, we were able to do three panels for each and every unit, 150 solar panels total on the roof. The other challenge that they were having was that they just didn't understand what the restrictions were. Solar was very new in 2010. And so they were asking questions and not getting answers from the other people they talked to. They brought me in. I basically had to translate my competitor's bid for them and say, this is what they're saying they can do. And this is what it's going to cost. And these are the tax benefits you would receive. And then I would, and then I put it side by side with my proposal and they're like, oh, okay. Now it all makes sense. Yeah. We're going with you. It was like, once it all made sense, it was very easy to decide. And we had to run all the wires down the chase, down to the mechanical room is three story building. So there's lots of little details and stuff involved, but once you can define the dimensions of the problem. All you have to do is solve now. Yeah. So has that type of thing happened a lot throughout your career where it's, if you come in with the proper, really well thought out, thought out solution, that's how you beat out all the competition. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was just having a conversation with some or somebody earlier today and they were having a situation with a certain auto manufacturer that says their battery on wheels can, their electric vehicle can power the house, but they don't have the hardware to actually make that happen. They only have the advertising. And then the solar contractor that says they have a marketing alliance with this auto manufacturer, but the systems will not support each other. They are not compatible. So I was having a conversation with a customer about, okay, so if you're concerned about, can I recharge my car when the grid is down and they're saying that their systems are not compatible. It's really all a matter of how you hook it up. So they're not separating the house from the grid at the proper point. If they separate it from the grid a little higher up in the stream, then what happens is that downstream you have the solar and you have the battery and the battery keeps the solar supported. So the solar inverter continues to work as long as the sun is shining, it's gonna refill that battery. And you're gonna be able to use power from the solar or the battery. The electrons are, Every electron is the same as any other electron. So it doesn't matter whether it's coming from the battery or it's actively being input by the solar panel. It just has to do with whether the wires are connected. I can solve that problem with a automatic switch gear and a smaller battery. And that way that will keep the system up and running. If there's excess power enough to refill the battery in the vehicle, that will happen as well. So there are always solutions. You just have to look for them. Yeah, I was curious how this big push of Ford and the Ford Lightning was going to go, because it's not always going to be an easy plug-in and like, all right, your home's powered. You have to separate the house from the grid. You have to have a switch gear. If you don't have that, then your power would be coming out of your battery into the house and also onto the grid and powering your neighbor's homes. They didn't pay for your car. They didn't pay for your battery. That doesn't make any sense. It would deplete it so quickly. So you really have to know the where you're, where you're wiring things and where the dividing line is. So not saying that it can't work. It's just that the particular pieces of hardware that would make it work are all in back order. And so we can't, I like to deal with solutions in the real world rather than saying, oh, we maybe will have this sometime soon and sign a contract today. No, I don't, I don't like that. Similarly, I sold the first two 
I'm pretty sure I sold the first two Tesla power walls that were installed in Colorado. And what was funny about that was we did sign a contract. Excel did answer our question saying, we don't prohibit interconnecting those to our system. Then we applied for that and they're like, oh, but we don't have a process to approve it either. So because they didn't have a process to approve it, it was de facto non-approvable. It took about 15 months to get those batteries installed. Now I'm still in communication with, I'm still friends with, receive referrals from these customers because I stayed in contact with them. Told them truthfully what the situation was. And we walked through the process when Excel had solved their paperwork and policy problem. We got everything submitted. We got it installed. It works. You know, that's fine. So when a guy walks through that process with you over months, and then later on refers family members to you, you know that he understands that you took good care of it. Can you explain what exactly a switchgear does and then what somebody can expect to spend on getting one installed? Yeah, I can. The No, I should say that a switchgear is not necessary for solar power, right? So grid-tied solar doesn't have to be disconnected from the grid. Grid-tied solar, the inverter will turn the DC electricity from the solar panels into AC electricity, plug it into the main electrical panel of the house, and it just powers whatever's running in the house. Excess goes back onto the grid. That's how net metering works. You get credit for every kilowatt hour that goes onto the grid. That's fine. You only would need a switch gear if the grid goes down and you have battery power that you want to use. So the way those systems are set up is you have the solar panels, you have the inverter for the solar, you have a battery, you have the inverter for the battery, which may be the same inverter as the one for the solar, depending on the brand. And then you have a switch gear so that if the, if the control system for the solar and battery detects that the grid has gone down, they, essentially your utility has failed, then it separates the house from the grid. And until the grid comes back up, you are your own independent unit. The battery provides power to the house and the battery's inverter sets that 60 hertz sine wave that is necessary for the solar inverter to keep working. So then the battery is providing that cushion. The solar will recharge the battery. You use whatever power you need to use and this can, this occurs in like 12 to 15 milliseconds with the top brands. So most of my customers hardly even notice a flicker of the lights. Their computers don't shut down when the switch gear comes in. It's so fast. It's different from a plug-in generator. With a plug-in generator, you lose your power. You have to shut everything off, throw a manual switch, you know, pull cord, start up the generator. It's just not as seamless. So while it's not necessary for most Americans, if you're in an area where you have frequent power outages, and especially if you're running a business out of your house or you have multiple refrigerators and freezers or any other equipment that just cannot go down, then a battery backup is really key. And this, the tech also allows you to now discharge, let's say your electric vehicle into the home, right? To power it. If you have a bi-directional electric vehicle charger, yes, those are more in development than available on the shelf right now. So I want to actually talk about something you brought up, net metering. So that's starting to go away in particular areas. So mm -hmm. what are we looking at when that disappears? Utilities don't love it. Right. When you have a monopoly, you want to protect your monopoly. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the American consumer, but that is the law of the land. In most states, there are regulated monopolies called power companies, and they certainly have a lot more money than you or I do to lobby the lawmakers and make sure that things are to their advantage. Now, in California, we've seen a collapse of net metering 2.0. It's now been transferred into 3.0. There was a huge rush to get everybody signed up that could, everybody that was ready to pull the trigger and start their project. But you had to have those applications submitted by April 14th of this year. Now it's too late. If you're in California and you get your power from SDG&E, SCE, or PG&E, if you get your power from somebody else like Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, 
you can still get net metering. You can still get retail value for the power that you produce. But people in those three investor-owned utilities, they are out of luck. And so it is a very time-sensitive issue. It's very timely to be talking about it. And for particular customers, it's a serious issue. So I have, I have a, I don't do a lot of business in California, but I am licensed in California, one of the only states that requires a license and a background check. So there you go. Now I'm not a felon. The, I have customers that started their project in March. We got the paperwork submitted to PG&E and another one to SCE before the deadline in April. And that application will come with NEM 2.0. So they'll get full value net metering. Any later application, no such luck. Okay. So it's just the timing of the application makes the application valuable. And it's really important to take care of this. So I have a customer in California where this is the case and the, my installation partner, unfortunately failed to show up on installation day. So this is the first time this kind of situation has happened to me in 15 years, 1400 projects. Okay. Failed to show up, refused to set a new installation date, basically said that they could not deliver the equipment. Well, the customer had already paid half of the cost of the system. This is not acceptable at all. So I had to, and I'm not going to name the contractor, absolutely not part of this interview. But what I will say is that I issued a demand letter to my former partner to refund the money and turn over the permits and the interconnection application. And after the customer received all of that information and funds, they said, okay, since we don't have this installation partner that we can trust, who do you know that you can trust to actually deliver the service and then installation? And that is going to be handled by another company that I know that has a very solid track record. I know the owners personally. And this other one was very disappointing. That was what happened. But my point is that I advocate for my customers. I solve the problem and I'm going to make sure that when somebody is interested in solar and they have a suitable roof for solar, that we get that job installed. Okay. There's not going to be any negative changes to them. No price increase. Actually, we're going to give them a slightly larger system for the same price just because of upgrades in the models of panels and, uh, and they're still going to get their full value net metering. So it's really important when people consider going solar that they work with a consultant and a, and a company that has a good record and a good reputation. Well, this has been very insightful today. If our listeners wanted to get in touch with your company or yourself, how could they do? Oh, thanks for asking my company name, which is also my mission statement. Company name is solar for planet a for being the number. So you can look me up at solar for planet a.com. And there's a contact page right there. And I see I've received a couple of inquiries today through my website. So at, right after this interview, I will be looking up those addresses so I can see what the roof looks like and calling the people that inquired. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for coming on the show. And thank you everybody for listening to another episode of failing to success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.